Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is my console. I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to promote my own novel, which has just been published. It is both in print form and ebook form. It's a family saga dating back to 1946. It's a whodunit. It's full of family strife. It's a restaurant based novel. And not too many restaurant based novels around that I know of, anyway. The title is Family Recipes, and I will say I struggled with that title because I didn't want it to sound like a cookbook, but I stuck with the title because I, I think it plays well to what the novel is actually about and serves as a double entendre. Besides the recipes that the restaurant uses, it has a lot of um, family implications in there as well. The subtitle is a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. I think my wife nailed it when she said that it reads like my big fat Greek wedding, but with Italians rather than Greeks. So naturally, I implore you to buy a copy available on all the major book selling platforms in print and ebook form. Just go to Amazon and type in Mike Console into the search bar and family recipes will come up along with my first novel titled Hardwood. So I'll read to you the first section of the book in just a little bit. But first of all, what is Family Recipes? It is the story of Vinny Marciano, owner of the most fabulously successful Italian restaurant in all of upstate New York, and his neurotic family members, all of whom he employs in the business. Marciano's manja house was bequeathed to Vinny by his beloved uncle, Nunzio Marciano, who opened the manja house in 1946 and quickly turned it into a culinary landmark. But the handoff from uncle to nephew came with some inviolable stipulations, the most important of which was that Vinny pledged to never let the secret family recipes fall into an outsider's hands. So all is pretty much hunky-dory until the safe in the restaurant's business office is breached and the Marciano family heirloom recipes dating back generations to the Abruzzo province of Italy are stolen. So Vinny, of course, is stunned and livid, and his suspicion immediately falls on family members, with his deepest suspicion targeted towards his sisters, two of his three sisters, sisters Angie and Maria, who have made evident that they're, they have ambitions to break away from, from Vinny's fiefdom and open their own manja house in a neighboring community. So Vinny has put on notice that if he doesn't successfully recover those recipes, and if he doesn't recover those, his uncle Nunzio will wrest back control of the, of the manja house. Now, Vinny's overriding fear is that his prized possession, the restaurant itself, will be handed over to another family member or family members, perhaps one or both of the sisters that Vinny considers his prime suspects. Then come ransom demands from a caller with a breathy female voice that no one recognizes. So by this point, Vinny has enjoined the assistance of a man named Wes Fitzgerald. He's a defrocked cop turned private investigator, as well as calling into place Sergeant Detective Clyde Chablonsky, who is with the local police department. Now Fitzgerald has this penchant for violence and Jablonski becomes sexually involved with the only one of Vinny's three sisters who he doesn't consider a suspect. Vinny's brother and the story's narrator, Mickey Marciano, does what he can to hold his family and his brother's mental state together as an escalating series of events just amplify Vinny's sense of doom. So a break comes in the case finally, and finally brings the saga to a shocking conclusion that leaves Vinny believing there might have been family involvement after all, though not of the type he originally suspected. So that's kind of an overview. Now I'll read for you the opening section or so of the book, which is divided into sections rather than chapters. The opening section is called The Obsession, and it reads like so. Food is an American phenomenon. It has replaced sex as the nation's chief form of intimacy. We take it in our mouths, masticate it with our teeth, maul it with our tongues, and swallow it into our bodies. 
and second only to the weather as a topic of conversation between strangers and casual acquaintances. A fine meal is a mandatory accompaniment to any romantic encounter. An aptitude for cooking and food preparation is the most essential talent a spouse can bring to a marriage. It's often used to spice up our sex lives. Frank Sinatra famously ate a ham and egg breakfast off the chest of a Las Vegas call girl. Less famous lovers dip and smear genitalia with flavored oils, lotions, and syrups. I once gnawed a pair of edible panties off my wife's pelvis. Friends wouldn't think of sharing significant moments without breaking bread. Food is so abundant in the post-industrial societies of the world that eating isn't strictly about subsistence anymore. It has become recreation. Most of us cannot fathom missing a meal. Doing so creates the illusion that we have entered a state of starvation. Being deprived of food is a popular form of torture. Trying to lose weight by restricting calories is a page straight out of the masochist handbook. Nothing provides more abiding enjoyment than eating. We can dine repeatedly without diminished pleasure. We indulge several times a day without having to think about it. Food is something that even the most disciplined among us simply cannot resist. Our favorite meals are more addicting than tobacco, alcohol, and firearms, as well as controlled and illegal drugs. Food gives us comfort. Light, chilled dishes cool our bodies in the summer. Hot, dense entrees warm us during the winter. The variety of ethnic cuisines and their styles of preparation stagger the palate. We bake, barbecue, broil, fry, grill, roast, saute, sear, steam, microwave, fondue, and flambe them. Certain foods are even given magical qualities such as chocolate, garlic, truffles, and red hot chili peppers. Just thinking about food makes mouths water and stomachs growl in the language of visceral desire. No aroma is more heavenly than a meal in preparation. There's no stopping America's all-you-can-eat gluttony. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, desserts, and in-between meal snacks are so prevalent that 30% of us have eaten and waddled our way into obesity. Another 30% of us are clinically overweight and well on our way to joining the rotund ranks of the obese. Food is a matter of life and death. I should know. My name is Mickey Marciano, and food is my life. I cook in 10 bar at my brother Vinny's restaurant. It's called Marciano's Manja House, and it is, without a doubt, the most successful Italian restaurant in all of upstate New York. The restaurant's sterling reputation spans the state and brings diners from Buffalo and Niagara Falls, Syracuse and Rochester, Albany and Poughkeepsie, and even from the Big Apple itself, the world's supreme restaurant market. Our menu and monumental success is built upon two dozen secret family recipes brought from Italy to the New World by our immigrant grandparents. We pack the place nightly and rake in a cash flow that would make an old-fashioned Latin American drug cartel proud. This is a family-run operation in the truest sense of the term. Marciano's belongs to Vinny lock, stock, and barrel, and every key position is filled by a family member. Our parents and siblings all work here. We all draw fat salaries that keep us living in big homes and driving late model automobiles. While I uncork bottles of wine, draw beers, and polish down the bar, my sister Ginger plays hostess, escorting famished diners a group at a time into the enormous dining room, made to feel even more spacious by its 25-foot-high ceiling and crown molding. Sister Maria runs the dining room as head waitress, and Sister Angie keeps the books and manages inventory. Brother Ringo stretches and dresses the dough for our legendary pizzas. Mother Margarita and Father Elby are on the cooking line, slaving over hot stoves, boiling kettles, and sizzling saute pans. Vinny is the floater. He jumps in wherever and whenever needed. Mostly, though, he has a good time playing master of ceremonies with our many regular customers and telling everyone to manja, manja, butchered Italian for eat, eat. He visits me at the bar often so I can blend his favorite drinks and light his cigars. Then there is the most important Marciano of them all, Uncle Nunzio, the founder of Marciano's Manja House, and the final word on all matters pertaining to food, beverage, and Italian pride and culture. He is the family's undisputed leader and vanguard of the secret family recipes, upon which the business has flourished for more than half a century. They are the family's secret covenant, 
and he is the grand master of their clandestine preparation. Section 2 is titled The Family. One couldn't help but have concluded that Uncle Nunzio was predestined to play a lifelong role as culinary wizard and restaurateur. From his early teens, he was standing next to the stove at his mother's elbow, getting splattered with hot grease, asking questions, helping her cook, and being called a femme by his jeering brothers. Nunzio would not be deterred. He was fascinated by food's plant, animal, and mineral origins and how they could be paired infused in ways that electrified the taste buds. The universality of food was remarkable to him. It was the most significant thing all living entities had in common, the need to consume nutrition. The old woman never tired of giving her protege detailed explanations of food combinations, cooking temperatures, culinary styles, and the proper use of kitchen utensils. She taught her son the treasured family recipes hailing from the mountainous Abruzzo province, east of Rome, and dating back numerous generations. Nunzio started with simple sauces and salads, but soon he was grilling fish and making layered dishes such as lasagna and various parmesans. Then he was sculpting and frying meatballs and mixing and squeezing dough for homemade pasta. As his skills and confidence with cookery improved, Nunzio eventually prepared complete family dinners on his own. World War II took Nunzio off to the military and a U.S. Army post in New Guinea, where he played a starring role in the mess hall. He proved himself a crackerjack chef and baker. Nunzio became more addicted than ever to the power of food and the outpouring of attention it could earn its purveyor. What could be more fulfilling than earning your keep making people plump and happy, he decided. What could be a more basic and noble endeavor than providing life-giving nourishment to mankind? An army runs on its stomach, the post commanding officer continually reminded Nunzio. When the war ended, he returned home and announced his intention to open a restaurant bearing the Marciano appellation and family crest. Parents and siblings rallied around the idea, pulling together the modest sums of money at their disposal to put Nunzio into business. The largest portion of the venture's startup capital was provided by his parents. Just prior to handing over the bankroll, that was the realization of Nunzio's dream, Grandma Marciano swore her son to eternal secrecy about the family recipes. Generations of family members had protected them for posterity's benefit, Grandma Marciano told her son in harshly accented English, and the recipes were never to escape the family circle. Nunzio kissed his mother's hand and said, I'm a good Italian boy, Mama. You know I would never betray the family. Besides, you would slaughter me like the fatted calf if I ever shot my mouth off. And with that, Grandma Marciano rolled a tightly wound wheel of money across the table and into Nunzio's dough-encrusted hands. He leased a building picturesquely situated on the northern bank of the Susquehanna River. The year was 1946. The place filled quickly, and the dishes it served were greeted with gluttony and superlatives. The Manja House's reputation fanned out across the region. Word eventually reached the food connoisseurs of Manhattan, even members of the snobbish New York City restaurant scene made pilgrimages to get a grasp on how an upstate restaurant located 200 miles northwest of the center of the food universe could be causing such a stir. Uncle Nunzio's stature grew. Despite the grinding six-day-a-week work schedule, it seemed the great man would go on forever. Then along came a 2,000-year-old malady known as gout. So there you have it. That's part of the second section, but I'll end it there. A sample for you. I hope you like what you heard. I hope you'll buy a copy of, of my latest novel. I very much appreciate you taking the time to listen. For Novelist Spotlight, this is my console.